This is Off Planet Radio. Welcome everybody to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins and um, today is exciting. It's exciting on a level that um, both in terms of our guest and in terms of the fact that we are actually recording in front of what you would probably call a live audience. We have a group of people from our Patreon group who are attending today and that will play more into uh, the second hour when we're going to become more interactive with our guest. Our guest is somebody whom I've had the privilege of knowing since 2011 when a publisher, a friend of mine named Joseph Lumpkin, who owns Fifth Estate Publishing Company, sent me this book. Maybe you can see that. And when he sent it to me, he didn't tell me a lot about the book. The book's kind of worn because I've actually read it. Uh, he didn't give me a lot of background. And when we talked, I said, I don't really do fiction. And he goes, no, you need to look at this closer. This is something more than fiction. So I started to read the book and I got excited because in 2011, nobody had done what this book had done in terms of revealing the background of not only the previous election cycle, but also the economic collapse, which we were still at that time deeply into in 2011. The interesting part is I picked this book up a couple of days ago, opened it up to the first chapter and realized that this book actually in 2011 anticipated the candidacy of Donald Trump as US presidency. Back then, I don't think many people were talking about that. It goes deeper than that. It goes into the type of thinking, the analysis of events, and how we begin to understand the fabric of real-time things that are going on right now. I'd love to do a show and not talk about coronavirus. We can't do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring to the table today uh, some magnificent thinking, logic, analysis, and tools for everybody out there who's watching this to begin to assess in real time the events we're living through. Our guest today is going to be introduced by my co-host, Emily Moyer. Welcome. Hello, Randy. Nice to be back. Nice to see you all. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, today is a really special day for me because I get to sit with two gentlemen um, who have really helped to form and shape the way that I think about things and have also given me permission to use my own intuition and creative imagination and how I put together scenarios and that has led me to be able to do this and have people listen. And in 2011, when my life was in a huge mess, I sat in my apartment building listening to Randy, who I was a longtime fan of, interview this gentleman today on a book he'd written called Coup de Twelve, although they only really talked about the book a little bit. I listened and something about this gentleman spoke to me um, in a way that was like, pay attention. And I immediately got the book, read the book, and from the way he put the information together in that book, taught me how to look at the entire tapestry and decide which threads to pull. Not only to not be confused by the mainstream BS, but not be confused by the second and third level BS that they've created sort of stables around to herd those of us who question mainstream reality into and to get stuck in like a cul-de-sac that just spins around and around and to know which threads to pull on while still observing the whole tapestry. And so I'm very excited today to get to have a conversation with someone I really look up to, Dr. David Martin. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. Thank you so much, Emily and Randy. It's great to be back. Um, it is odd to think about the fact that the book in 2011, uh, 3 to 12, was in fact a forecast of a number of very specific things and unlike a lot of people who say that you can't forecast future events, um, yeah, I, I think that that opening assumption is predicated on the notion that somehow there is some sort of unseen hand of fate that somehow 
um, moves around. And, and the fact of the matter is I didn't forecast anything. I just read the evidence. And when you have the evidence of things that are unfolding, it's not hard to say this is the evidence of what's coming. Um, you know, it wasn't a guess. It wasn't a guess in 2011, and it's certainly not a guess today. So great to be back. I guess where we begin this today, David, is in your current projects. But tell people a little bit about your background, because it's so extensive that sometimes I, I'm like, I don't know how to describe you. Emily has described you as an integrative economist, as a, as a shorthand term. But that really doesn't completely cover what David Martin does? I called him an integral economist. Integral an economist. Integral, right? Yeah. Integral economist. And an so, inverted alchemist. <laughs> an alchemist yes. Yeah, and, and, and my TED talk was called the Fulcrum Ninja. I remember that, yeah. All kinds of, there's all kinds of, of, of different titles. I, I, when I am asked what I do, I actually say I live. And that's not being trite. Um, I was at a very young age identified as a person who had some unusual characteristics that were exploited by um, the United States government. Yep. Um, <laughs> and, There's and, a theme that you know, runs right through this. If you go back and look at, at, at what that, that whole um, period was, um, you know, the record on what was being done at Stanford Research Institute mm -hmm. with various forms of, of human capabilities. Um, was something I encountered at a very young age, and and um, you know, probably most most publicly and most prolifically, people have seen some of the evidence of that work through my work at the Arlington Institute, where I did an enormous amount of work on scenarios, uh, forecasting, and so forth. So there's there's a a part of my background that is probably best described in a very simple metaphor. When when my Father was my geometry teacher in 10th grade. Um, he had a, a, a challenge that was if anybody could come up with an original proof of the Pythagorean theorem that had never been published before, they would get an A for the year and they wouldn't have to show up for class. Um, the, the bad news is if you put a challenge like that or any other challenge in front of me, there's an outside chance that I will spend an enormous amount of time researching everything that people have done on the topic and then finding the obvious thing that isn't being done. And not surprisingly, a few weeks later, I slapped a stack of papers, which 200 steps into it was an original unpublished proof of the Pythagorean theorem using spherical geometry and, and, and a certain set of other very interesting tangents. And it turns out that I in fact did uh, in the 10th grade come up with an original proof of the Pythagorean theorem um, he broke his promise. I still had to take the class the whole year, and I still had to work for my A. But, but the fact is, that I look at the world in a different way, and, and I encourage people to think about the fact that what I don't do is I don't accept any assumption. I always look behind the assumption. And so whether it was in my medical training, I was on the University of Virginia faculty in the School of Medicine. Uh, the, I've been a member of the business school faculty. I have been um, an adjunct and advisory professor and lecturer at universities around the world. Those are all in my official bio. Um, so I have an academic bent, which is a deep passion not to tell but to in, equip inquiry. That my, my goal is not to answer somebody's question. My goal is to give them the tools to go out and answer their own questions. So from the education standpoint, I bring that bias. From a technology standpoint, I was the developer of a technology called linguistic genomics, which is a fractal database structure which allows you to look at intent-based communication analysis. Simply put, I look at language as code, like any other cryptologist would look at, at information. I look at language as code. What is being said is never the artifact. As, as Gregory Bateson very famously said about language, language is about boundaries and pointers. Your brain fills in meaning. The job of a linguist is to put the boundaries and pointers up so that your brain can fill in meaning. And as a result of that, I developed technologies that were not only used for pharmaceutical and medical device research, did a lot of work on early proteomics and early genomics, 
but I also did an enormous amount of work on intelligence gathering for white collar criminal investigations, international intelligence, et cetera, which is what informed a lot of the coup de 12 book. Um, and and the, the underlying technology says that every piece of communication is surfaced not as an artifact, but as an intent. And so what our technology does is it looks for the intent of communication, not its ordinary course meaning. And so there's a whole business around that. We run the conference board, which is the official measure of the US and global economy. We run the conference board's innovation index, which is the official measurement of our economies. Um, that's all done on our core platform. We have trading algorithms. We do all sorts of other things that are are how we deploy it. So we have a whole technical commercial component of our business. And the third component of our activity is called innovation literacy. And innovation literacy is really about identifying communities of unusual perspective. I don't use the term indigenous. I think it's derisive and I think it's demeaning. I use the term communities of persistence. And what we do is we enter into and engage with communities of persistence around the world to see what perspectives are being engaged by other communities that might inform how we live. And then we share that information through what's called the Heritable Innovation Trust. So we've got a whole bunch of things we do. So everything from medicine to core technology to computational analytics to encryption to you name it. Um, I've often said that there's very few technologies that I don't have some direct contribution to at some level over the last 35 years. Well, wow, that, that's broad sweet. Any one of those could be a spinoff topic on it. I'll just add as a footnote here, David also grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is in the Susquehanna Valley here. <laughs> um, for those of you who have just partaken of the show we did with Michael Wan, who's also in Lancaster County, uh, that we recorded last week, you'll see some synchronicities flow through that as well. Yes, I grew up on a Mennonite farm hand milking cows. So that's where all this started. And I didn't have a TV, which may have something to do with how I think. It's probably the best thing that ever happened to you. <laughs> so where do we go now uh, in terms of uh, immersing ourselves in the, um, the core issues? Emily, you wanna? So, so I thought, you know, I've been watching your Butterfly of the Week videos and some of the other little things that you've put up. And I thought maybe what we could do, because my hope is that this public portion of the conversation will be something that we can share for those of us who are in this community that have deeper questions about reality. We are in um, a struggle with our families right now as well. There's divisiveness happening and I'm hoping for something because the way you speak about things is a way that people of academic uh, esteem and whatnot can, can understand in a way that some other sort of information that is shared in the alternative media does not speak to them. So my hope for this is that you can sort of lay out some of the information that you've done in some of those and we can converse about that so that we can yeah. share this widely. Yeah. So I think it's good, Randy, to just set a very simple stage as I did in, in my Butterfly of the Week uh, just yesterday. Um, we, we are living in a period of time which since 1944 has been a deeply profound anomaly. And the, the anomaly is that a group of 730 people in Bretton Woods set in motion essentially a very interesting and, and somewhat uh, undisclosed set of agendas about what we now call kind of globalization or new world order or what have you. The Bretton Woods Conference in 1944 was a very interesting reach. And it was a reach for a number of reasons, but probably the most interesting for me is that it was a group of individuals. And remember, it was only 730 people who put in motion what for the next 80 years was going to be the dominant driving structures of our time the whole genesis of multilateral organizations, multinational organizations, and multilateral alleged best interest kinds of things, whether that be the World Bank, the IMF, organizations like the derivation of what became the United Nations, all of these organizations from which things like World Health Organization and other initiatives are born, all came from a group of people who desperately wanted to create a dependency on the US dollar 
as the central denomination structure for how global trade worked. And, and the Bretton Woods legacy is that 70% of global trade ultimately became fundamentally traded on what we call the US or the petrodollar or the defense dollar or the debt dollar or whatever metaphor you want to use. Now, what makes that interesting is 1944 is also a very fascinating time where as a society, we in 1944, and by we, I don't mean the Third Reich and I don't mean Germany. We as a, as a North American community, we as a global community, still thought it was appropriate to work on eugenics. And I know people think, oh, no, 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 that was only the Nazis. They're the only ones that did the great race exercises. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at who informed our science in the 1940s and going into the 1950s, there was an enormous focus on eugenics. How do we create or enable some sort of superior race or great population? Um, we, we did horrible things across race, race relations. We did horrible things to people who were potentially classified in one form or another as somehow disabled. And what we did was we insisted on a eugenics model which gave birth in the 60s and 70s to the notion that life was unraveled or deciphered through a thing called DNA. We put our bets on Watson and Crick. But the irony about that, and the reason I'm doing this history is it's super important to understand that that was born of eugenics. That was born of an effort to try to identify what made the great race, the ideal human, the whatever. And the reason why that's important is because if it weren't for our scientific dependency on the eugenics defined DNA structure, which as most of you will know, is the unraveling of the way in which nature actually informs the transmissivity of information, which is through chromosomes, not through extrapolated strands of monofilaments of double helix, right? You have to take chromosomes apart to get to DNA. You have to take DNA apart to get to RNA. You have to get RNA taken apart to get to proteins. We have a model that we have never been willing to consider as potentially the reason why we're willing to define an organism as its DNA. And the reason that's important is because we don't have a thing called coronavirus 2 or SARS coronavirus 2, just like we don't have coronavirus 1, if we don't have allegedly a DNA distinction which creates something allegedly new. Now, what's important about that? What's important about that is in 2002 and 2003, we allegedly isolated, and there were two groups, Dr. Storr, who I talked about yesterday, and the group at CDC, who I talked about yesterday, two groups came to the conclusion that they had identified and isolated a thing called novel coronavirus. Nowhere has it been published what constitutes novelty, what level of same is same, and what's the threshold of different. We don't have a definition of that, by the way. So the, the coronavirus that gave rise to what we called SARS in 2002 and 2003 was a coronavirus that we hypothesized somehow transmitted from animals. Now, I'm not saying it did and I'm not saying it didn't. What I am saying is that the fact that we see a virus in one form of an animal and the fact that we see that virus in another form of an animal doesn't mean we can clearly state from. We don't know the answer to from. We can hypothesize it and there's nothing wrong with asking the inquiry. But we don't know what from is. And the reason that's important is because in 2003, when the United States Department of Health and Human Services Center for Disease Control filed a patent on the human transmission of novel coronavirus, and you heard exactly what I said, in 2003, the Center for Disease Control filed a patent on the human transmissibility of the novel coronavirus. That act isolated in our consciousness the notion that there was the ability to identify and render as a single structure the coronavirus. 
Now, I, I, as I said yesterday, there's a whole conversation on whether the morality of patenting a virus is something we should even be doing. I happen to have a very deeply held view that it's actually unconstitutional to patent life or any expression of life. Therefore, I think the idea that you can patent a virus is absolutely ludicrous. But the fact that they did that is actually setting in motion a series of events which leads us to a very interesting problem because as anybody who knows the patent laws is going to be familiar with, the patent on coronavirus is about to expire. Did you hear what I just said? The patent on the coronavirus is about to expire. Mm -hmm. If you have a patent that's about to expire and you are a pharmaceutical company or a medical company or anything else, what might you be incented to do to make sure people understand you've got something for which you want to have recognized value? Remember that a patent is a legal instrument to block others from the research, development, and commercialization of a particular thing. And the CDC patent is running out. And if they are going to monetize or influence the future of coronavirus, they are now almost at the end of that particular patent's useful life. Tiny problem? Yeah. 17 years in, they didn't come up with diagnostics and they didn't come up with vaccines, despite all of the money, hundreds of millions of dollars that they poured in, not a single dollar came about. And so what we have in this very long arc is an interesting problem where the multilateral agencies that were started in Bretton Woods carrying forward to today, including World Health Organization, including a number of the UN development goals and objectives and the programs that were developed around those, and the eugenics, which led to DNA, which led to the isolation of allegedly novel viruses, which, like I said, I'm not saying there aren't viruses and I'm not saying that they may not, they may not be novel. I'm saying we don't have a clear criteria that actually establishes that these things, in fact, are anything other than our projection of a particular scientific model on nature. And we know that there are multiple other explanations, like exosomes, whole number of other structures. There are a lot of things that are in fact reality and that are accepted as reality that challenge the hypothesis. But we're not allowed to ask and answer those questions because the CDC has decided through its patenting of a virus that it is going to dictate the commercialization of the narrative. Can I interject a question at this juncture? Go um, for it. Uh, this brings to bearing the question of what is the nature of the CDC if it's able to hold intellectual property? Is it a corporation? Is it proper for a quasi-government agency, which is what they are, to hold in trust, and I use that term not lightly, intellectual property the way that this is being performed? Well, under a series of laws, and the one that your viewers are going to be able to access most easily is the Bayh-Dole Act, which was the 1980s decision to allow federally sponsored research to be patented, which in and of itself is a moral conundrum, right? When the public taxpayer has paid for research, which is what all of the National Institutes of Health and DARPA and, and oh, all of the SBA loans or everything else. That's taxpayer dollar paying for research to subsidize laboratories and universities. Is it appropriate for the taxpayer then to have to pay to access for the derivatives of that research? And in the early 1980s, Congress made the decision, yes. And that extended just for, for all of our benefit, that extended not only to healthcare, but to defense, to infrastructure. So the Department of Energy has enormous numbers of patents. The Department of Health and Human Services has numerous patents. And they are notoriously terrible at commercializing them. So there's a, there's a horrible consequence of this, which is the public policy was, yes, let's make public institutions qualified to hold patents. 
But when a public institution holds a patent and then fails to commercialize that patent, and as a result of the patent's existence, also precludes others from being able to do research, development, and commercialization, that's where you have not only a legal but a moral problem. Because the public paid for research and by filing a patent on it, that research is withheld from others in terms of its application and use. And that should be, but it isn't, should be illegal. We as a public should be able to benefit from the research that we pay for. Thank you. This sounds like the, uh, what we experience a lot in these situations, as in the economic collapse, where we have the, um, private, the, the socialization of debt and the privatization of profit or, or benefit, right? It's a similar kind of thing. Yeah, so, so not surprisingly, as much as people like to think of CDC as a public organization, and, and there is a public charter, so I'm not saying that there isn't a public charter, but the CDC has a foundation, the CDC participates in enormous numbers of private sector commercial activities, and the CDC also participates in, in, in very lucrative grant exercises. So the idea that it's somehow just a beneficent group of people sitting around doing wonderful things to try to make our lives better is absolute horseshit. It's just not true. That, that cannot be and is not justified by the evidence. If you go back and look at how the Center for Disease Control was set up, and its selection of being in Atlanta. Originally, it was selected to be in Atlanta because that's where malaria research was being done after the end of the Second World War. The malaria research turned into a number of other things, including other transmittable communicable diseases. That went on to become the basis for an enormous amount of work in STDs. So as we became more and more aware of STDs, both in a public health sense but also in the manipulation of potential eugenics applications. Center for Disease Control actually set up a whole host of other types of relationships and partnerships. And if you look at the economics just around coronavirus itself, you see multi-million dollar grants where CDC and universities and private sector have worked together to pour hundreds of millions of dollars into filing proprietary claims on the management and unfortunately, in the case of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, the chimeric modification of coronavirus, yep. which in 2016 was considered to be potentially a moral and potentially ethical act that should not be done. And there was a moratorium imposed by NIH on that, which the North Carolina University decided to ignore. You just brought up a, 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 a rather unique point because it was only yesterday when I found an article and posted to Twitter questioning, was this in fact a, a chimeric virus? Was this virus mutated? Well, so what we have in the scientific literature reported about coronavirus is that there are innumerable variants of the coronavirus. If you look at the work that is done by the bat researcher at Wuhan Institute of Virology, um, her work suggests that the mutations, both the human variants as well as the zoonetic uh, variants are, are huge. I mean, the idea that we can say there is a virus is absolutely ludicrous. The fact of the matter is the, the backbone of the coronavirus has innumerable variants. The one that seems to be implicated in some of the worst expressions of illness right now, which is a spike protein, which has to do with the way in which this particular virus enters into the cell through what's called the ACE2 receptor, which is the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor, which is part of the reason, by the way, why people who have uh, vast, um, pulmonary disorders as well as kidney disorders seem to have an unusually negative outcome. And that's because the angiotensin converting enzyme receptors are prolific in those, those tissues. The, the fact is that we know that not only is the ACE2 receptor sensitivity very high, but it is high in several forms of the coronavirus. So we don't know, and there is no evidence, and, and by the way, Please, please don't take my word for this. Look at the papers 
that are being published. The fact of the matter is, we don't have a criteria for what constitutes a defined subvariant because the mutations are so high and because the virus as a structure has many chimeric alterations that are naturally occurring and as evidenced in the patent that I talked about yesterday from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill where the researchers are explicitly splicing together protein expressions and RNA transmissive expressions of explicitly separate coronaviruses, which they're weaving together to create a chimeric alternative. And, and you can't read claim one and claim two without seeing that claim one says you're taking one set of, of expressions of a virus, you're taking a separate, separate expression of a different version of the virus, and you're merging them together to create a chimeric third virus. That, I'm not making that up. Read the actual claims of the patent I posted, and the fact of the matter is, University of Chapel Hill has clearly stated that you can make one of these things. Now, once again, I'm, I'm not describing, in, in the expression of this, I'm not describing something that I think is morally justified or, or okay. I'm simply stating the fact that UNC Chapel Hill has clearly said you can make a virus that has particular virulence profiles, and they put the recipe into a patent that they filed in, uh, I believe they filed it in 2013. I know the patent was in, in, in force and in review in 2016. So where we are right now in terms of, I guess maybe we can flip this over into beginning to do some of the analysis of understanding how we got to where we are today with, frankly, most of the world, I refer to as the Western world, but most of the world is in a lockdown. They call it quarantine. This is technically not quarantine because we are sequestering healthy people. So taking it from what you just gave us as a background, what are the most what is the profile, the most important points we need to look at in order to come to what I would say are well-informed opinions and thought processes? So in my work, I try to use, and Emily made reference to this, I use a process called integral accounting. And the integral accounting framework, um, which I use to do every investigation, always triangulates information. So you never rely on a single point or you never rely on a single thesis. You have to actually build three, in fact, in some cases, competing hypotheses. And the reason you have to do that is because it's very easy to find patterns that become self-referential loops to confirm a bias. But if you are constantly testing three hypotheses at the same time, unfortunately, some of the data doesn't fit and that kicks you in the butt and says you have to think about this slightly differently. So I look at three what I call axes and the first one is alchemical and the first al what I call the alchemical axis is where you take matter and energy and to matter and energy you ascribe value. Now we know from thermodynamics matter and energy just exists. It's just an is condition. It's not created nor destroyed. It just exists and when we prioritize or we place one thing above another, that's how we create the illusion of value. Something is more valuable or less valuable. Something is more important or less important. So, so hierarchy and matter and energy are one of the axes I look at. What are the actual things we're messing with? The second axis I look at is what I call ADOS, using the Greek term for the appearance of things. And that second axis looks at how we are being organized in our observation. What are the optics that are being placed in front of us to look at? And what are the technologies which make those optics ubiquitous? So very simply put, you know, a, an example of this is we have this thing called social media. It's a technology, but it's a technology that informs the nature of, of, of our inquiry, right? How many times have I been told um, the reference that you just gave, I can't find on Google. As though Google is the only 
mediator of information, right? I still go to libraries. I have libraries. I have libraries in my house for a very good reason, because a lot of stuff isn't online. Um, but we're told that we have this world where the only thing that exists is the thing that is the self-referential loop that if you can't find it on Google, it doesn't exist. And if, you, if it does exist, then it must be on Google and so forth and so on. But that's, that's an example of the ADOS axis where the optics of how we see the world are being influenced by the technology that we're being told is the way you see the world. And then the third axis is what I also use the Greek term gnosis, which is the deep knowing. It is the association between the, what is the transmitted narrative? What is the story that we're being told and who is benefiting? Who is being served by that story, right? So those three axes, alchemy, the matter and energy, the value, the ADOS axis, which is the, the way we see the world and, and the technologies that we're given to see the world, and then the knowledge of what are the stories we're being told and who's benefiting from those stories. Those three axes are the way we build a research hypothesis. Now, I didn't mean to bore you with that, Randy, but it's important to understand that if you want to build three hypotheses, much like Plato said in The Republic, an alternative hypothesis is not a negative of your hypothesis, right? A negative of your hypothesis is the same hypothesis. It's just the inverse of it. To hold three different hypotheses is really important. So in this case, we are being told health, okay? This is the, the narrative. We're being told health is in jeopardy. So that's a knowledge narrative, right? We're, we're being told that there's this thing that is health is in jeopardy and we need to look at who it's serving. And who it's serving is public health institutions, the organizations that are advocating for vaccines and therapies and other large pharma kinds of things. So they're benefiting, but they're not the only ones that are benefiting. Who else is benefiting? Benefiting hugely are corporations that are stay at home business models, Amazon, entertainment, so forth and so on. Also benefiting hugely are people who have a business of tracking human behavior on social media, right? They're, they're amazingly successful right now. They're tracking enormous amounts of information. That's not just corporations. That's corporations, that's governments, that's all kinds of organizations that are living in that space. So we have an axis that's really well filled. We've got a narrative that says that this is a healthcare story. We've got a bunch of people benefiting from that story. But that's not the only story because we also have this silliness around the technologies that are used right now for crowd control. You know, if we were 40 years ago, we would have had three channels on broadcast TV that would have gone into 120 or 120 million homes, and we would have been told on the nightly news that certain things have, have to happen, and we would have had 30 minutes to consume that information. Now, we are being pumped with information 24-7, and the the great thing about it is we're holding on to technologies, literally with mobile phones, mobile devices, laptops, TV screens, everything else. We are being controlled by the devices that we have decided somehow are to our benefit. Somehow or another, we are being manipulated to have immediate responses, right? How did we know that there was a shutdown? Did you get a letter in the mail? No. Did, did, did you get... Did you get some sort of, you know, car driving past your house saying you're now under quarantine? Like, no, we, we, were, we were given a message through a series of pieces of media and suddenly we had instantaneous compliance. Now, I look at something like that and I go, damn, that's cool and it has nothing to do with a virus, right? It has nothing to do with an illness. It has nothing to do with anything. And by the way, you want to see who's compliant? Tell them to wear a mask. Tell them not to walk outside. Tell them to this. Tell them to that. Have them stand on their head on Tuesdays. Do whatever, right? This is, this is one of those things where you can find out who is doing what it used to take, things like research organizations. You know, once upon a time, you'd, you'd have, you know, 
media organizations that had to prove that they are being watched or listened to. Guess what? You don't have to do that now, right? There doesn't have to be a survey of viewership. All you have to do is go to a grocery store parking lot and you can see everybody who's been on social media in the last 20 minutes because they're now wearing purple masks upside down on their left eye patch because you might catch something if a bird shits in your face, right? Who, like, it's such a wonderful experiment. And the great thing about it is none of us have been able to stop and say, oh, what if I just presume that I didn't have my computer on? What if I didn't presume that I had my mobile phone? What if I didn't presume I had my laptop open? What if I just was living? That was me yesterday. I went out to a store not knowing that they had ordered Pennsylvanians to begin wearing masks in public. Yeah, right, right. And then, and then shame on you, but guess what? Great on you, because that means that you weren't immediately linked into this crowd control exercise. And so when I look at that, I go, okay, there's another thing happening. And the biggest thing that's happening is if you look at the matter and energy section, which nobody is talking about. Remember, we made up we made up a novel virus, which we've known about since 2003, and we've been screwing around with in the lab since 2011. So the idea that somehow or another, whoops, this thing jumped out of the bag and we suddenly have this novel thing. It, the, the problem with that one is scientifically, the evidence shows very clearly that since 2011, we know there are chimeric variations. Since 2016, we've been patenting the, the particular virulence that is being expressed right now. So, this is not new. It wasn't new in November of 2019. I mean, read the North Carolina patent and you can see that we knew about the mechanics of this thing for a very long time. So, so there is, this is not new matter and energy. This is something else. And my, now this is where I'm off the reservation. And I told you that I will tell you when it's my opinion and I will tell you when it's fact. This is my opinion, people. So be very clear on this. I'm not telling you this is the case. I'm telling you this is my research hypothesis. My research hypothesis is that we are being encouraged to be forced into a test on our threshold of tolerance of redefining our values. And I think what's being done right now is under the guise of a public health manipulated scandal, what is happening is we are finding out very quickly whether Americans and people throughout Europe and throughout Asia and everywhere else are willing to have a significant reduction in their quality of life. And by that, I mean very specifically, are we willing to decrease our consumption, not based on our consciousness, not based on our choice, but by centralized control? Are we willing to see our small businesses and communities fail? Are we willing, like CNN said this morning, to see over 100 community hospitals fail because the U.S. government and state governments decided to close elective procedures, which are the only revenue sources for those hospitals, such that we now have a world in which if you have a car accident in West Virginia or Kentucky or Tennessee, the likelihood that you will have access to emergency medicine has been closed down because the local regional community hospitals are failing and you know damn good and well that what will happen. And by the way, look it up on CNN. CNN just had the story today on this whole shutdown of local community hospitals that are going to go under. If you look at that and you say, well, who's benefiting from that? Don't think for a moment that large aggregators of healthcare are not going to swoop in and before long you're going to see five healthcare providers large corporates who put up their distressed acquisition program to buy distressed hospitals and before long we've consolidated not community access centralized access to medicine but for-profit access to medical services which are going to destroy the local health and the local community economies. That's happening. And the question is why in the world of public health, why under the guise of our well being, are we sitting and watching our local community hospitals close 
allegedly to make sure that the high virulence and prevalence of a disorder in New York mean that Tennessee and Kentucky and West Virginia and Virginia and Georgia and Louisiana and Arkansas, why are we accepting that the closure of community hospitals is an acceptable trade-off for a bad year of unusually high and unusually violent respiratory distress in a population that is less than a half a million people? And the answer is, the story isn't the story. The story is about an economic stress test on our tolerance to accept a centralized lower standard of living so that the individuals who profit from it have a consolidated way to pick our pockets much, much more. And there is no question in my mind that that's the most compelling thesis we have. Emily, did you have something you wanted yeah, to do? I can't disagree with that. I mean, you just laid out sort of the health and economic basis, for, you know, what we're being told and how people are thinking about this. But I'm thinking that the deeper question and the one that I'm even more concerned by than that is, are we willing to cede our common sense to, to a group of people that everything they say is based not in logic, not in facts, but in theories, simulations, and na 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 na, right? We see people who are doing things not because they make sense, but because they're told to. Well, and Emily, that's a great question. And let me, just, let me just point out very quickly, and I won't answer this in a long way. I'm just gonna answer it a short way. The University of Washington and Johns Hopkins University and the Center for Disease Control have colluded, along with the Imperial College in, in the UK, have colluded around promoting a fear narrative that said that we were all in dire straits and everybody was gonna contract the disease and many millions of people were gonna die. That story, they had to backpedal from very quickly because as soon as people read the models, they realized, first of all, they were based on influenza, which we were told not to compare anything to, right? Here's the influenza model that we're going to use to scare the shit out of you, but you're not supposed to read that it's an influenza model because only trained scientists can navigate the distinction between influenza and influenza, which is absolute crap shit, right? We, that can't be true. We, we were told that, that millions of us were going to contract it, millions were going to die. That narrative, which was the narrative, and if you go back and read, particularly the University of Washington Hopkins studies, what you'll find is that in their most egregious scenarios, they recommended in their scenarios a reduction in healthy population interactions by 50% as an extreme, as an extreme. Nowhere in a single piece of epidemiological research has there been a single model that showed a healthy quarantine of 3 billion healthy people. That has never been modeled which means that when you are being told that that is a healthcare recommendation, your governor is lying to you. There is not a shred of scientific evidence that a single person can surface that actually says anything greater than a 50% reduction of casual healthy contact is even modeled. We do not have a picture in a statistical model and we do not have a picture in a research model for anything other than the fact that we are being forced into an artificial intelligence simulation. And the tragedy of it, Emily, is that the intelligence was indicted to have failed with the first count of infectiousness. But we are not allowed to make the observation that holding people accountable to their own bullshit research and then saying, as an informed reader, it's not only bullshit research, you yourselves have announced that it was wrong, right? So this is not about me going off on a rant about maybe I philosophically disagree with public health epidemiology research that is computer simulated by people who like to play video games instead of live freaking real lives. Sorry, that was a rant. But <laughs> and we enjoyed it. Is, the fact of the matter is somebody needs to call this out. These individual models were built for video games for video simulations. 
for pandemic models. They were not built for real human application. And just because you have a scrawny guy sitting in the University of Imperial College of freaking the UK who can terrify just absolutely mindless governors. You know, Governor Cuomo should be seriously tried for stupidity. Well, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm already, I want to impeach the governor in Pennsylvania for I what mean, he did because it was he, draconian. He, he has not, he has not read, he has not read a single one of the articles upon which his recommendations are based because if he did, he would actually realize that he is promulgating yeah. a model that, that researchers themselves have not considered to be reasonable. But you know what? Mindlessly beat the drum, right? Just mindlessly beat the drum. You're the governor of Wisconsin. You're the governor of Michigan. You're the governor of wherever you are. Mindlessly beat the drum and never take the half hour it would take to read the papers upon which this intervention were built and go, holy shit, we're recommending something more draconian than the papers even recommended. This is not a fight around science. This is a cover up to measure the compliance and the cowardness of a society. That's what it is. And it's to cover up the financial fraud that I've talked about since 2011, Randy. David, there's one other leg to this that I want to explore in this segment. It has been since January when I started to follow the story. My somewhat informed but definitely not proven theory that there is a very large economic agenda playing out as well in a multifaceted operation. That being first off, China as an, China as an active agent in bringing this forward when we're looking at documents that tell us that we were doing basic research on genetically engineered viruses. Secondly, that at concurrent with that, we have been in a trade war with China for the last 18 months when Donald Trump brought forward the tariffs, which impacted not just China, but even our own industries. And then the larger argument is that we have systematically since the 1970s collapsed our infrastructure, manufacturing, logistics, and intellectual property into mainly China, but really the entire Pacific Rim. And where that puts us strategically at a time when it also looks like they want to redo the economic game again, a la coup de 12. Yeah, well, and, and tragically, if we really zoom the lens out, as I've said in my inverted alchemy posts, in my presentations time and time again, the, the, the New Deal, which was supposedly what took us out of the Great Depression, mm -hmm. had a use-by date. And unfortunately, we happened to be living in the milk went stale in the fridge. That's what happened. Yep. We built entitlements that through the 70s and 80s and 90s became the basis of political games. We built pensions that courtesy of hedge funds and other structured finance became the cash that was leveraged by private equity firms to take the future income of promises made to employees and use those as leverage to de defund and bankrupt pensions. We, we did a whole host of things which if we admitted to any of them would lead to such gross civil unrest and, and anger that we create stories that cover the bigger problem. And the bigger problem is an accountability problem. We have a multi-trillion dollar debt. The deficit and the trade war with China was not going to end, right? No amount of wishing the trade war out of existence was going to somehow resolve it. The fact of the matter is we, under our own volition, in the 1970s built an industrial policy as the United States government to equip China to be our low-cost subservient provider. 
of goods and services. And then we actually forced early on, if you go back to 1980s, uh, right up to 1987, yep. there are wonderful papers by the Commerce Department that say, we need to equip China with technology and manufacturing capabilities so that they don't rely on the Soviet Union and they rely on us. We built the thing that we now say is our trade war enemy. No different, by the way, than what we did in the Second World War with Japan, right? This is the same playbook. Oh, yeah, when we it built is. the MacArthur Plan, yeah. and when we built all of the plans to rebuild after the Second World War, we built the thing which ultimately came back to bite us in the butt. Newsflash. We did it with China, and China did one thing that we didn't count on, and that was they sent researchers to our institutions of higher learning, and they learned and went home. Unlike other countries where an enormous number of people stayed, what happened was Chinese got profound knowledge in materials, healthcare, computational technologies, communication technologies, everything else. They got their PhDs, they were postdocs at our universities, and they went home. And we're now surprised that well-trained, thoughtful, intelligent people are in fact well-trained, thoughtful, intelligent, and are you ready for this? patriotic to their country. Newsflash, that's not a breakthrough of consciousness, that's actually self-evidence. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, there was no way we were going to win the trade war. And Trump knows that, and Xi knows that. But Xi knows that he's got another problem, and his problem, as I mentioned yesterday, was the one-child policy is now biting China in the butt. And now they have to figure out how to turn their consumption economy into a domestic production, domestic consumption model. They were on an export only model. Now, every time China complains about the fact that its exports are falling, I laugh. They don't care. That's like back in the, back in the, the, the wonderful days of my childhood when you could actually still talk about this story of the Br'er Rabbit. You know, don't throw me in the yeah, Briar Patch. Yeah. Don't throw me in the Briar Patch. Hard, guess baby. what? Yep. The Briar Patch, is where they want to be, right? They want to invert their consumption so that they can have domestic production for domestic consumption. That's what they're doing. So Xi is winning this, not in some sort of existential kind of US versus China war. Xi is winning this politically because he's doing something that takes a hard landing of an export only model and turns it into a domestic consumption model. He's gonna win. Now. Does that mean there aren't going to be hard times in China? No, but it does mean that China is going to come out with a high degree of success and we're going to come out looking like idiots because we put our manufacturing capabilities, we put our foreign debt ownership, we put our interests in a country that, are you ready for this, was looking after its interest. Ooh, there's a shock. Whoa, yeah. Yeah. holy crap. You mean that some countries actually look after their own interests? Are, are you serious, Dave? Is that, is that the heresy that you're going to promote? Yes, it is. We lost, not with the trade war, we lost a long time ago. We lost when GE sold its bundled by $3 billion power system to the Chinese for the Three Rivers Gorge Dam and for the long haul locomotives and everything else. We lost a long time ago. It has nothing to do with a trade war or anything else. Now, what that means is that the bigger story is we are going to have to figure out how to build an American economy. And this is the big punchline. We're going to have to figure out how to build an American economy without declaring war. Because the only way America has ever built its economy in the past, the only way it has built its economy in the past is to create a war. We have not built a peacetime economy since 1776. And go back and look at the history. Look at DuPont Corporation, right? One of the yep. great US corporations, right? Yes. Yeah, as a manufacturing company, manufacturing munitions for the Revolutionary War. That's what it was. Look at all of our great companies and ask yourself, do we have any of our great companies that survive if they don't first and foremost have the unlimited checkbook of the Department of Defense for military acquisition? 
and I mean any of them. And the fact of the matter is, we are living in a time where our great challenge is will we have the ability to build a peacetime economy from the ground up? Now, that's a challenge. I'm not saying we can't do it. I'm saying we don't have a playbook to do it because we haven't. Wow. Yeah. All right. I have one question that I want to ask before we end the, the first hour um, and move into the patrons section. And this is, I think, maybe taking it down to a more personal level for myself, but also for probably everybody who's here, right? I think each one of us is dealing with some version of, we may have one family member that is afraid of us because they're in somewhat compromised health, yep. though they have been for, for the last 40 years, suddenly this has made them afraid of me, right? Because I, you know, am a germ factory or something, right? Like, you know, I still go, I, I still go out. I'm not practicing the same level of social distancing that I'm being told by the government to practice and all that kind of stuff. And another family member who thinks that I'm unloving and uncaring and selfish because of my, how I'm choosing to behave based on my perception of the reality and what my moral core is. And it's leading to issues that theoretically have nothing to do with the virus, but this, in my opinion, is the real virus. This yeah. is the mind virus. What do we do, David? Yeah, so that's a tough one for me because I'll, I'll be the first to tell you that having, and I told you this at the beginning of the video, having grown up in a Mennonite community um, and having heard the last hour, you can imagine how loved and embraced I am by my family. Um, so, so when it comes to deep levels of, of um, what should I say, empathy about those who have titles based on a proper noun, of their role in potentially my life, I have a very specific response. Love and liberty, in my mind, go hand in hand. And I'm gonna give you my definition of liberty, which is my translation of the definition of liberty from Cyrus the Great. Liberty is when you are capable of engaging at your optimum, where your exercise of that right does not impinge on the exercise of the right of the other. Okay? Now, listen to what I said very carefully. Liberty is not hedonism. It's not indifference. It's not apathy. It's you being willing to allow an individual full latitude to be who they are and understanding that. At the same time, they allowing you to be who you are and understanding that. And I don't believe that there exists a concept of love without liberty. If I have had any experience in my life more important than this, I can't think of it, which is to be able to get to a point of saying, just because you have a label, you're a mother, you're a father, you're a husband, you're a wife, you're a friend, you're a whatever else, just because you have a social label does not mean that you can place upon me, nor can I on you, a restriction of the context in which my well-being and your well-being thrive. And the minute a belief system, a dogma, or anything else becomes more important than the relationship, you as the relating party have opted out of liberty. And as a result, have opted out of love because for me I have a capacity to love and I have a capacity to engage and I have a capacity to tolerate absolutely you want to believe anything have at it you want to live a particular way have at it you want to do anything you want to do in the practice of your sense of reality go for it but do not ask me to enter your illusion don't ask me to enter your delusion. Don't ask me to enter into a space where the only way I can accept living with you is because I have to suspend an attribute of myself. 
Because if you have to ask me to suspend my intellect so that I can be friends, then you're not friends with me. You're friends with a form of me that is being made for you. And I know, Emily, this is not coming across as overly loving and empathetic. But that's because we have a bullshit definition of love and empathy. Mm -hmm. We have decided that it's okay to be cowed into submission by people who, by virtue of who they think they are, are entitled to demand upon us our loyalty and our abject adherence to whatever their value system are. And we are being told that it's unloving to hold our own integrity. And the answer is, that's not true. That's not true at the individual level, and it's not true at the corporate community level. The fact of the matter is, our challenge as humans is to say, will we be willing to simultaneously tolerate those who are entirely different from us, but do it in the social contract that says that as we tolerate, so we are entitled to expect the tolerance back. One more thing. Hey, before we hop off the public hour, David, why don't you tell people where they can find yes, your work? Yes, absolutely. Sure. Um, my, my YouTube channel is David Martin World. My website is davidmartin.world. Try to keep it simple. And from there, you can get to Inverted Alchemy. You can get to my corporate website. You can get to everything else. So um, davidmartin.world uh, gets you everywhere. David Martin World. And my live shows are on Facebook Live. The truth is out there. It's inside you. And now more than ever, you better really start to dig for it. We'll see you in the next show. This is Off Planet Radio.